Good day, potheads and political junkies. This is CCN Live, Cannabis Culture News Live, and we're broadcasting from Vansterdam, beautiful Vancouver, British Columbia. I'm Jeremiah, editor of CC, and uh, today on the show, Vote Dana. Tommy Chong signs up for the BC NDP to support BC NDP leadership candidate Dana Larson. We're going to talk to Mr. Larson. We're going to play a little video. Uh, of Tommy Chong giving his endorsement of Dana for you guys. Uh, what else we got on the show? Jody Emery's going to be on the show talking about the latest on Mark Emery and what's going on in his Georgia prison where he was fired as a librarian there and now the rumor is he's got his job back so he uh, he's going to be a little happier there. We'll talk about that with Jody. And I've got news for you and also tips on how to get the best from your vaporizer. If you guys like vaporizing your pot uh, watch the show. I'm going to go through an article that we published on CC about how to uh, use the vaporizer properly, the right temperatures, that kind of stuff, written by Chris Goodwin and Matt Murna from Toronto, the Hash Mob Boys. Um, so, yeah, first on the show, I just wanted to talk about the big news. Tommy Chong endorsed Dana Larson, and I have the video of it here for you. Now, we're just going to make sure, I just want to make sure everybody's here, 60 viewers online, all right, we're doing good, and... Uh, Woohoo! How's the sound out there, guys? We've tried to correct our sound problems. Last week we had a major problem and couldn't get the sound to function at all for the first part of the show. Eventually we corrected it, but uh, we hope that everybody sounds good. People are saying good, nice, and we've got 60 people there, so it looks like we're rolling. All right, well, so here it is. Tommy Chong joins the NDP, the BC NDP, to support Dana Larson. Tommy Chong is a Canadian and he lives here in Vancouver. He's got a residence here. And uh, he... Looks like uh, when I went to that little clip there, you guys couldn't hear me for a second, kind of strange. Ah, uh, no sound. That's very odd. Um, we'll make sure that doesn't happen again. Hold on just a quick second here. No. All right. No, that, that's, uh, I'm not really sure what that is, but when I click the image, the sound goes off again. Very strange, this Ustream broadcast program. Still ironing out, ironing out kinks, obviously. But, uh, yeah, I better, I'm, I will try and fix it. That's okay. I'll, I'll go to my images quickly, and if they don't have sound, then I'll flip back, so, just so you guys can see them. Um, okay, so let's actually, I'm going to play the video here for you of Tommy in the store down here at 307 West Hastings, uh, and giving his endorsement to Dana, and then we'll... Dana is here in the store, so we'll talk to him as well if I can get him. He's back there somewhere. Hold on just a second. Watch this video. All right. Hey, I'm Tommy Chong, and I just joined the BC NDP. And the reason that I joined is because of one man, Dana Larson. Now, Dana Larson can change the face of this country, but he needs your help. You need to join the BC NDP, and you need to join before January 17th. And I urge all you Canadians to come and join the NDP, and for one reason, Dana Larson. So yeah, nice. That was the uh, video there of Tommy supporting Dana. Now we have Dana here. He's going to roll over a chair. Hello, hello. And here, I'll move this camera a little bit so we got a little bit more space. Oh, there's Jody too. We've got headless bodies floating around here. We'll move the camera a little hello. bit. How's the show going? We have our audience checking it out here. Cool, Dana. So good to have you back on the show. You were on last week. It's it good awesome. to be here. Look what I got here. A big stack of any oh, yeah. farms. People are busy signing up for our party and uh, helping to support uh, my leadership campaign and also just supporting the NDP in general because we've got some good ideas and uh, you can join up to the NDP. You've only got one week left if you want to uh, become a member of the party and be able to vote for the leader of the party, for me or for whoever else you might choose as leader. And uh, the deadline is January 17th, so you don't have a lot of time left, but you can join online at bcndp.ca slash join. Of course, you can go to my website, votedana.ca, and if you go to the Support Dana section, there's links there to help you join the party as well. 
And uh, the actual vote is in mid-April, and you can vote by phone or online, so you don't have to leave the comfort of your own home for this at all. If you got a credit card or a printer, then you can join online and print out the form and mail it in, or just do it with your credit card on the internet. And then in April, you can vote uh, for me, hopefully, as leader, and uh, don't have to leave your own home at all. So you can really participate and make a big difference uh, from the comfort of your own couch. Cool. And so, t let's talk about Tommy Chong. It's pretty great that he decided to support your campaign. How did that happen? Uh, I'm really thrilled with how this has worked out. And uh, Tommy Chong is a Canadian citizen. He's been one his whole life. He was born in Alberta and he lived in Vancouver for many years and is still living here now. He does spend a lot of time down in California for his uh, acting and movie career and television work, but uh, I think his heart and his home is in Vancouver, and he's now an official member of the BC New Democratic Party, and he's encouraged his fans and supporters to do the same thing, and he's done that because he likes my campaign and what I have to say. And I'm really honored to have a Canadian icon, someone who's uh, world famous, whose books, uh, whose movies, uh, TV appearances, uh, uh, his, his record albums, uh, he's a talented musician, and he, these days he's often in the media as a political pundit and commentator. And uh, he's an intelligent and very funny person, and I'm uh, really glad that he's uh, gotten involved in the NDP and called on his fans to support my campaign, and I hope that they get out there and they do that. Awesome. And uh, Tommy is actually doing a tour across the United States and it was they did stop in Canada for a few, the Get It Legalized tour. And I'll put a link up in the show notes to where you guys can check out the tour dates. I think he's going again now out to do another batch of them. They do have more projects on the go, yes. Cool. And so, Dana, about the Canada scene, about the leadership campaign, um, what can people do to help besides just signing up with the on the forms themselves and and, uh, and sending that in? The number one website. thing you can do is join the party and get your friends and others to join the party because this is about numbers and about having people able to vote and having enough people there to make a difference. And uh, there's about ten to twelve thousand members in the BC NDP right now. And if I can bring in a few thousand people, and we've got membership forms at our dispensaries, they're available here at the Cannabis Culture Headquarters, they're available at uh, various locations across the province. And we want to bring a lot of people into the NDP. And it's not even just about this leadership campaign as well. I've been trying to sign up the cannabis culture into the NDP for quite a while. And aside from my leadership aspirations, uh, this, uh, this summer in June, the federal NDP is hosting, having their, their convention in Vancouver. And the last one was in Halifax, and I had some inventors and misadventures there. And at this convention, we'll be bringing forward some uh, really good policies on marijuana and, dr and drug uh, issues that we want to get passed. And, it's also a nice social time. If you're, if you're from out of town and you want a place to stay, we can help you set up with that. You might even be able to stay uh, on my couch or in my uh, spare room downstairs. I want to get a lot of people uh, into this province and at, at this convention. I think it'll be a lot of fun. And uh, the provincial NDP is also having a convention at the end of the year. And so regardless of who the new leader is, there's a lot we can also do at that convention to have a fun time and get some ideas through. And, uh, and the, the cannabis culture, I think, is a politically aware culture, and, and we're people that really want to make a change. And, and we have uh, knowledge of this plant, and we have knowledge that, and ideas that I think are an important part of uh, where our country should be going. And uh, we're, we're members of our community, and we want to be recognized and not treated as criminals because we use marijuana medicinally, or socially, or spiritually, or for whatever our reason is for partaking of this wonderful plant. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so that's why I'm in the NDP and I encourage everyone who's watching this to, to get involved and help me out and, uh, and come on board. And so Dana, this isn't just like, you know, people out there might be saying, well, you know, Dana, if he doesn't win, then I'm a member of the NDP and I, you know, it's, this isn't just Dana in the NDP that wants to, that has a policy of legalizing or of the lowest pri police priority. This is an NDP policy. So when you join the party, it's not like this is just Dana's thing. The NDP itself is all about this stuff. Yeah, the, the BC NDP passed a resolution that I helped write in 2006 that calls for the party to completely support uh, taxing, regulating marijuana. Uh, access for medical patients and amnesty for everyone who has uh, marijuana convictions in the past, uh, things like that. But every party has many, many policies that they pass at convention, uh, and only some of those make it onto the platform and, and become part of the, 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 the campaign and the, the effort when they're government. And so although uh, I think the grassroots of the party and most of the leadership of the NDP supports uh, the idea of decriminalizing, taxing, regulating, controlling cannabis, it's never been a top priority issue for the party. It's always been down there somewhere uh, after the top ten issues. And so I think my goal within the NDP and, and getting involved is to help push this up to a higher, a higher priority into the party and for people to recognize that 
Cannabis is important not just because of the plant itself, but because of all the other areas of public policy it impacts. Um, any issue you bring up would be better if marijuana was legalized and worse under the current system. From homelessness or people who are who are drug addicted have problems uh, finding a home, and if they were able to access uh, uh, cannabis medicines or able to access other drugs they need through prescription and through a, a doctor, they wouldn't necessarily have to spend all their money and end up being homeless because of the drug addiction. And if we look at our economy, it would be much better off if we taxed and regulated and controlled cannabis and uh, brought it above ground where it belongs. It would be a huge financial boon to our province. And if you look at issues of policing and civil rights, it's clear that our police would be uh, better off if they could focus on real crime and uh, not being burdened with having to prosecute these uh, cannabis laws. And maybe we wouldn't even need so many police if we didn't have these laws. And uh, there's many areas of public policy where, where cannabis intersects and where it's an issue that, uh, that is relevant. And if it's only because of the financial loss that we're spending all this money to prosecute cannabis users and to fight against this wonderful plant and not cashing in on the windfall it could bring us. Uh, so it's an important issue, but it's not the only thing I talk about. You know, something else I'm keen on is democracy. And one of my other key uh, agendas uh, as leader of the NDP and as Premier would be to fix our ballot initiative system. And the NDP brought the system in in the early 90s. And, uh, you know, they had good intentions to allow more referendums and more people, more opportunities for the citizens of this province to have a direct vote and voice in the issues of the day. And, uh, and to correct governments when they go wrong. And we have many examples of the Liberals promising no HST, promising not to sell BC Rail, and then doing the exact opposite. And in 15 years, or, or more than 15 years, the only time we've ever gotten something on the ballot has been this HST vote. And I believe that there's been more times in the past 15 years that the people of British Columbia should have had a direct vote and an option to, to uh, have their direct say on the issues in the province. And so I think we could fix the ballot initiative system, make it more accessible, so that we can have more referendums and more opportunities for direct democracy. Because I'm a big fan of democracy, and I think we need more of it in this province, and in the NDP as well. And I would work to reform the NDP, to use the internet and modern technology to open up our party to the grassroots, so that uh, the members of the party can be involved in crafting policy and, and getting involved in the actual party, and not just... Uh, uh, having a say every couple of years at a delegated convention. Uh, we could really make the NDP into a real grassroots activist party that really represents the people of this province, and that's seeing what politics is all about. Awesome, Dana. So get your forms, go to votedana.ca, and uh, we'll be keeping you guys updated on what's going on over the next like week, and then after that, um, as we approach a time where people will actually be able to vote, and we'll, of, co we'll of course, on Canvas Culture, put up all the information about how you can actually take part in the vote and do all that stuff. And Dana, in the meantime, there's going to be this period of about uh, three months after the deadline is up. Now, is there anything that people can do after that period to help you? Well, you know, if you're watching this or you're after January 17th, please still join the party. I mean, it's not just about getting me to the leadership. It's about a, a movement we're building within the NDP, finding a political home for our cause and our people. So uh, join the NDP no matter what at any time because uh, even if it's January 19th, you can still come to the convention in, in June. You can still help to choose your candidates and set policy, and you can have a lot of fun. You know, I've met, I've been all across this country. I've been to like 20 NDP conventions. I've met lots of my fellow New Democrats, and they're fun people. Uh, the people that I've met understand marijuana policy. Many of them enjoy cannabis themselves, and certainly it's a, it's a welcoming place, and uh, and you can have a lot of fun. And don't be discouraged by, by some of the challenges I face within the NDP. Uh, any party has these kind of challenges. I am pushing hard to make these changes and push things forward, and, uh, and really I'm having a lot of success, and I'm very happy with how things are going within the NDP uh, with my crusade uh, to make these changes, even though it seems sometimes I, I'm being set back. Overall, I think we're really making a lot of good progress and, uh, and bringing a lot of things forward. And you'll be hearing a lot more from me over the coming months. And if you see me being interviewed or you see comments on the internet that you want to respond to, please do uh, write letters to the paper supporting my ideas and my campaign. Uh, someone saying if they had money, they would join. It only costs $1 to join the NDP if you're underemployed. It's $10 uh, for regular people or whatever, but the regular amount is $10. But if you're under 26 and you're a young New Democrat, or if you are underemployed, which is up to you to decide what that means, then there's no minimum donation other than some kind of cash donation. So I just say one dollar is the minimum amount. And we've had people donating one dollar, we have people donating four hundred and twenty dollars to join the NDP. So we have a vast spectrum and whatever you can afford. The NDP is a, a socialist party. We believe in, in democracy and anybody should be able to, to participate regardless of their income level or their, how much cash they have on hand. 
So $10 is, is a good amount. If you can afford it, that's great. But if you can't afford $10, then just kick down a loony. It'll be the best investment you've ever made in your freedom and in the future of our province, uh, that dollar that you spend. And uh, you can also, I know we said, you can vote online or by phone. So you can do this uh, from the comfort of your own home, the whole procedure, and you can really make a big difference. And get your friends online too. Uh, you can see me on Facebook. I I'm very busy on Facebook. And also uh, there's a, a Dana for uh, BCNDP Leader page on Facebook. I encourage you to join that as well. And if you're in a different province, if you're not in BC, get involved in the NDP anyways, because this is a national party. We're all on the same team. Uh, Jack Layton is by far the most outspoken and supportive uh, leader when it comes to marijuana policy. Uh, Libby Davies is a huge ally of our work. And, uh, and so there's a lot that we can do to make these changes. I've got this big stack of membership forms. We're starting a big movement here. I'm taking these in today to get processed. Please get them online at votedana.ca or bcndp.ca slash join. And let's make a difference. And we got nice buttons and t-shirts and fun stuff. We're opening our campaign office uh, very soon. And uh, you'll be hearing a lot more from me on the media. And I'm going to go Excellent. get back to my campaign. Awesome, i got more things to do. Thanks Fantastic. for being here. Uh, VoteDana.ca. That's right. In the show notes, there's links to all the places where you can go to find out more about Dana. You can find the videos, the Tommy Chong video, all of that stuff there. And if you don't have a credit card and you want to sign up, what you need to do is get one of these forms. You can print them out on the link that's provided on CannabisCulture.com in the show notes. And uh, that's the BC NDP membership form, and you can send that directly in or bring it into one of the offices. I Imagine. Now, it's getting close to 4.20 here, it's 4.16, and uh, we're going to be sparking up the Volcano Vaporizer here. So I'm going to move it down just a little bit and make some room, and we'll, uh, we'll show you guys how the Volcano works. I, I'm sure that a lot of you out there have used a Volcano before. Where I am here at 307 West Hastings, we have the BC Marijuana Party Vapor Lounge upstairs, where we have a whole bunch of these vaporizers. People can come down and use those. There's a $5 charge and you get to come and hang out for an hour and use the vaporizers and take part in the party, the BC Marijuana Party. And uh, so now I wanted to ask you guys out there, I see there's lots of people tuned in. We have 83 viewers on right now. And how many people out there are using a vaporizer? Do you guys use vaporizers? What kind of vaporizers do you like? If you haven't signed in, uh, you can click on this little Ustream link right here. If you're watching this anywhere but on the Ustream page or on the CC page, you can click that link and go and sign up to join the chat with everybody here. Um, so if, uh, if you guys out there are using vaporizers, let us know what kind you like to use. There's a whole bunch of different vaporizers. For those who don't know anything about vaporizing, there's a lot of benefits to vaporizing your pot instead of smoking your pot. Now the difference is when you smoke pot and you light it on fire, you're burning all the plant matter which combusts and that goes into your lungs as well and that is carcinogenic and can have other negative associations. So vaporizing, what it actually does is when you use a unit like this and there's many other types of units and um, I would, uh, there, there may even be an ubi over here I can grab to show you. They come in really little teeny tiny sizes, just little glass pipes and they range to you know big ones like the volcano here which are a little bit more expensive. But here at our store, at CCHQ, we sell all kinds of different vaporizers and uh, you know there's tons of different vaporizers online and you can go to CannabisCulture.com slash store and check out our supply or come down to the store at 307 West Hastings. And so the Volcano, for those who don't know, um, is made by a German company, Stores and Bickel, and it's... There was an article written one time, I like the title, it's How Rich People Smoke Pot, because they're not cheap for these guys, they're about... Uh, five to seven hundred dollars from that range. Um, there's also a digital one. This is a classic. And now I've got a story that I'm going to uh, that's in the show notes. That's called uh, "How to Get the Most from Vaporizing," written by Chris Goodwin and Matt Murnoff from Toronto, from the hash mob out there. And this is a great article. Uh, I'm going to click to it really quick. And if you lose my voice, I won't say anything. I'll be back in a second. Right, so that's how to get the most from vaporizing, um, and that's on cc.com in the show notes as well, and you can follow along with some of the stuff here. Um, I've also got from that article, there's a, a little dial uh, diagram that shows you the different temperatures on a classic, because you guys can't see it from there, but a classic volcano just has numbers on it, so it doesn't actually have the temperature listed. 
we do have a digital volcano that actually has the temperatures in Fahrenheit or Celsius uh, right on the on a little digital display. Now there's other vaporizers, recent handheld ones that also have a digital display, like the Vapier NO2, which we sell in the store also, which is a handheld one. It's a pretty awesome handheld device. Uh, we were actually sent a free one from the company to try out, and the person, Al, who tried it and wrote a review for Cannabis Culture, that's actually on the front page of CC right now. If you scroll down on the left-hand side on the bottom, and that's a, one of the best handheld digital vaporizers out there. So, um, oh, it's 420. So everybody, uh, let's see. Everybody out there, spark them up if you got them. We're going to blow a volcano bag up here. I'm just going to grab my grinder, which I should have with me. And this one works with a balloon system. So some of the vaporizers will vaporize the material. And so I was explaining what vaporization is. The vaporization of the plant material is actually boiling off the terpenes, the cannabinoids, and the flavonoids that are in the plant, and they leave behind the, the dirty plant matter that is a carcinogen when it burns in your lungs. So, I'm just going to grind up this weed here, and we'll stick this in the vaporizer. If you guys out there are smoking right now, glad to hear it. Has anybody, uh, has anybody ever used the Vapier NO2? It's just this little handheld guy. It's really cool. A lot of people around here, there's a buzz about it. Um, and uh, I don't know if we're sold out of them, but we had a bunch in the store. There's also another handheld called an Iolite, which runs on butane instead, which it, it, it's really sort of a nice looking one. They have a whole bunch of different kinds. They look kind of like iPods or something, different colors of them. And they're pretty good too, although I definitely prefer for a handheld the, uh, the one that uses a battery rather than butane. Um, but let's see here. So basically I've just ground up some of the weed. Oh yeah, here, let's, I'll show you what I'm smoking here. Actually, you know what, I'm not really sure what this is, but it's pretty decent. Uh, let's see, there's some herb. Oh, nice. And so that's what I'm busting up. And with the vaporizer, it doesn't really matter, I mean, how, it, it, of course, it's always better to have really nice pot, but even if you have, like, kind of crappy pot, or you have a bunch of stem, or even, like, roaches and stuff like that, the vaporizer is pretty good because it gets rid of all the plant matter and that junk and just gives you the good stuff that comes from it as you go at different temperatures up the dial. So it, it's really good for, it, and it does enhance the taste. So in this article, How to Get the Most from Vaporizing on CC, uh, Chris and Matt talk about using it for roaches. They did some experiments with roaches as well. And they said it worked very well. You get, you know, really high from it. But the taste, you can really taste the roaches. That's one of the effects of the vaporizer is you really get a cleaner hit of the taste. You can taste the, the pot a lot better and the variations between different pots. At least that's how it is for me when I use my volcano. I have a volcano at home. I was lucky enough, I won one actually. Oh, did you even say Happy 420? I did, yeah. <laughs> Happy yeah. 420? Happy 423! <laughs> and so, and I'm, I should have been prepared to uh, puff down right at, but... So what you do is you put, put the pot in this little device here, which has a little plunger on top that kind of keeps the weed down, and you throw that on top of the volcano. And I actually like to start my volcano, so actually I'm going get to the, get the story here, and I'll read you some of the parts of it, um, as I'm blowing up the balloon here. And my first temperature I'm going at is about six and a half on the dial, which I'll, I'll click on the little chart here. So that gives you sort of an idea of how the temperature works. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'll just read a little piece of it. Well, here, let's blow up the balloon first. So you sit this on top, and you press this little other button here, which blows the air through, and give it a couple seconds. And then on goes the balloon, which will blow up with the, the cannabis vapor, and you just have it in the balloon. And this way, it doesn't have a lot of air and other stuff mixed in there with it. So you get a pretty solid puff of smoke or vapor. Let's see here. So, yeah, if you guys live in the Vancouver area and you want to try one of these volcanoes out, come on down here. We have the Vapor Lounge upstairs and there's tons of them. They're really fun to use and it's kind of, uh, besides being a cool novelty, it's a healthier way to ingest your cannabis. 
So I'm just going to read this little part here. Um, this is from the article, How to Get the Most from Vaporizing. Flavonoids and terpenes, the smell and taste of toke, evaporate and begin boiling off at around... Oh, here's our... Begin boiling off at around 132 degrees Fahrenheit with water boiling at 212 degrees Fahrenheit. And he says, uh, you don't get very high with that kind of a combination because it's just lukewarm air. So you have to bring the temperature up a bit on this dial to over 5, uh, about 392 degrees Fahrenheit. Or he says here, bring up the heat a bit because THC has a boiling point of 392 degrees Fahrenheit. But with the Volcano Digital having the help of the Venturi effect, which is the, the smoke, I guess, blowing through, you can vaporize efficiently with the temperatures as low as 350 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, and he says problems start for the vapor head when you reach 451 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's a good, I like to start it at about six and a half on my classic volcano and then slowly move it up all the way, getting close to the top in three different bags. And so you take the, you just click this little thing off and you click this part on and then you have this big bag of smoke here. Awesome. I usually like to let it cool down for a couple seconds in the bag itself because often people will complain of a bit of a tickle in the throat. It, you know, when you smoke out of a big bong, I love hitting out of a big bong, and when you take one um, really quickly, you don't get that stale effect. And with, I'm not really sure if it's a temperature thing or what it is, but uh, there's been a few of us talking about it, and it seems like if you let it cool down just a little bit, it doesn't tickle your throat quite as much. So, and you know you've done it right when you can't see through the bag. You want it to be opaque like this. Um, there are people who set the, the dial a little bit lower, and it does burn off different terpenes, in, but the cannabinoids don't start until a little bit later, and the THC uh, is la much later where it boils off. And so you, you need to see it, or at least that's how I like it. Mm. Now, Ryan here, you got an ubi on you, brother? I don't know. Here, come on. My friend Ryan, one of the urban shaman, he loves the vaporization, and he uses an ubi. American Smoke List is going to love this. The Ubi is this little glass one. You've probably seen the ads on Cannabis Culture and in other pop magazines. And it's just a little glass one, and it's, it's pretty nice. It's a good little guy for the price. I can't remember how much they cost. 20 or 30 bucks or something. Yeah, it's not, not much. 20 or 30 bucks. And, uh, but this, you know, obviously if you have the funds to drop, I would, I would definitely suggest getting a Volcano. But there's a whole bunch of mid-range vaporizers in there that, uh, that will do the trick quite nicely. Ooh. Vapor. Stop so, the oil stands being ethical. Uh oh. Just can't believe it. We have problems with our prime minister. The things that he thinks are <coughs> ethical, <coughs> I don't think we agree on. But back to the vapor here. <coughs> you can use wet pot in here as well. So if you have a bunch of wet weed that's not cured, and uh, you know, you some people put it in the oven to try and dry it that way. If you want to, if you're really fiending to get high and you don't have anything, and all you got is wet pot. The vaporizer works perfect for that. You can dry it, um, and also, you know, really dry pot. You don't have to worry about that much. If you set the temperature a little bit lower, it will take care of the dry pot. You won't have to get that really harsh flavor of the smoke when you smoke really dry pot. It gets rid of all that stuff, and you just get the vapor, the THC, the cannabinoids, the flavonoids. Um, what else here? I'm just looking through this article. Yeah, and that, it, there's actually, the volcano itself comes with this little, I don't have it here, but it's this little plate that you put in between. It looks like a piece of, um, uh, what do they call that? That wool, steel wool, a little hardened piece of it. And you put vapor, or uh, sorry, you can put um, butter, you can put hash, you can put a bubble, any of that stuff right on there, and it won't leak through into the elements here. So. This thing's really good for smoking all kinds of stuff, and a lot of the vaporizers do come with one of those little plates, so you can smoke your extracts and uh, all the other types of cannabis goodies you like as well. And once, so once we go, we're gonna go through another bag here, and I'll show you guys what it looks like in the vaporizer after you the pot has gone through it. You're left with this brown sort of material, and that that material you can actually use that again. I would suggest smoking it, um, but you can use that. You can bake it into other goodies like brownies, things like that, and you can use it to make extracts, you can get butter from it, that kind of stuff. So it's actually a really efficient way to consume your cannabis using a vaporizer. And I find that actually just using it, like you see, I only put in probably about half a joint into here, so like 2.5 grams or something like that, or maybe a little bit more, maybe 3 or 4 grams at the most, into one of these here. 
and you get three bags from that. So it makes your weed go a long way. And if you know you're trying to save, it's a it's a good way to do it because your pot just goes a lot further for your dollar. Um, and then, of course, if you're into baking as well, you get, the, they call it vapor poo, exactly. And there's actually a big long list of names of what they call it when it's the, the little brown dirt left behind. Cash, reburn, spent, redope, duff, revap, post roast, gack, browns, Floyd Tibbs, Eva Brown, Mary Brown, vapor vapor poo, no toasties. My goodness, it goes on and on. Cashems, Vented, Vape Weed, Vape Doof, Vape, Vape Cron, all kinds of names. So this is this article's great. It's written by uh, Chris Goodwin and Matt Murnau. It's awesome. You guys got to check it out. And uh, here, I'll show you. I'm just going to do another bag, and then I'll show you what it looks like afterwards. So, again, there's all different kinds of vaporizers. And if you go to CannabisCulture.com slash store, then we have a bunch there. And uh, if you look online, you'll find all different kinds of vaporizers. New ones coming out all the time with new fancier stuff. The battery handhelds are pretty cool. I like one that you can either plug in um, or use a battery on. They do have the butane ones as well, and the Iolite is one. It's pretty cool, but there's definitely a lot of options. All right, so we'll just take this bag off of here. I'll show you guys what's left behind. You can see it gets really hot, but kind of burns the weed up here. And it's just this brown, it's like a brownish color. It looks just like the pot, but it's brown. And again, you can use that for all kinds of stuff, so it's pretty cool. All right, so. All right, so it looks like you guys are online here. Is everything going okay with the sound? You guys hear me okay? We're not having any screw ups out there. Uh, all right. So what's next on the list here? So I wanted to have Jody on the show, who's sitting right behind me. I wanted to have Jody come on and talk about the latest with Mark and what's going on with where he is down in his Georgia prison at D. Ray James yep. Correctional Facility. So I just want to make sure everybody can hear us okay, so everything's fine so far, sounds good, all right, we're doing all right? Cool, how yeah. many people are here? Um, it looks like we have 90 viewers online right now. Hello everybody. Jody um, Emery, the princess of pod. <laughs> <laughs> well, I post on Facebook most often, so that's where to get like real-time updates about how Mark is doing, but uh, my weekly videos also explain What's going on? And the latest one is posted on Pot TV right now on YouTube. That. So that's where you get the latest news. Um, he got his job back in the prison library after all the pressure of the phone calls and people contacting the prison. And the warden had come back from being on break and said that Mark shouldn't have been fired. So Mark uh, is very happy with that. Um, a funny little thing that happened is he got his hair cut and he asked for a trim and he, he's been given a buzz cut. <laughs> so Mark has no hair right now, which is very hard to try and imagine. I haven't seen him yet, but um... <laughs> bald Mark. We're going to wow. do the same. We're going to have to get new t-shirts made with a bald yeah, Mark head. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, that it's interesting. Uh, um. Joey, Dennis, you sound like you're not a big fan, Joey. I can't imagine it. I just can't. You haven't seen him yet. He, That's true. But he said the last time he had a buzz cut when he was like six or eight years old. So I just can't imagine it without hair. I just can't. So it's going to be very different. <laughs> I'll have to get used to it. Because I love his bangs. I love his little mop of brown hair, so... It'll grow back. Sorry, right. I still love him. <laughs> of course. Maybe, he, maybe he's going to go back into his afro stage at oh some point. Gosh. <laughs> Mark has had all haircuts. They've all been awesome, actually. I love the history of Mark's haircuts. Oh, oh. that's Phone, phone ringing, phone ringing. Here, I'll put that aside. Sorry, guys. I'm, if you're watching the show while phoning, I'm in the middle of a show. I was uh, listening to the talk about vaporizers, and it reminded me that there used to be something called hot box vaporizer, and it's just a ceramic box, and that was one of the earliest ones out there. And we did I looked through an old photo shoot we did uh, when this was the vapor lounge one time, and I had a couch there, and 
We did a photo shoot in the center for issue 60, I think it was. And, uh, you know, they used to have hot box food prizes everywhere. We gave them away in the magazine, they were really popular, and now they're gone because they can't compete with the evolving technology. New stuff. Well, Volcano was always around, but it was never affordable for the majority of people. So, right. hot box was like the secondary and the best best option otherwise. There's so others as well too now. Oh, there's so modern, many others A little bit now. modern and moderately priced, but really do the same job or, you know, uh, there's a lot of, um, actually, I can't remember the name of the other one that's really popular now, but there's one that's, uh, some people say they even like better than the volcano. I'll find out about that one and put it in the show notes. Um, there, there may even be an article coming or a blog post from Chris Goodwin about a particular one that he likes. Uh, I was wondering if you had a chance to talk to Dana earlier to watch the video. Was the, was the video played? The Tommy uh, video? Yeah, yeah, we watched okay, the Tommy video. Cool. It was cool. Happy. It was cool. Oh, and I put some pictures in here actually of. So I knew we were going to talk about Mark. And if you guys want to read about, there's actually a blog post by Mark on the website right now, but it's a little bit out of date now because Mark actually got his prison job back. So in that yeah. article, in the blog post that's up there, Mark had lost his prison job, uh, but now he's been reinstated, at least for the in the interim. But um, we shouldn't send him books, I guess, quite yet. You could still send Mark books personally for him to read, but the uh, donation project of giving books to the library through Mark, he said to put on hold. Um, he asked the warden how, how you know, if that's going to change at all because it isn't the rules. The rules are you can donate books, and the warden said to Mark, "Well, you would know better than I do in your job position." So. Mark has to figure out with the mailroom. I think he's having a meeting today with people to sort out what's allowed. So hopefully it works out. And so when, if Mark is able to get all the books, if we could just stack that yeah. library with all kinds of magazines and books, it would be really awesome. And what we really need right now is for people to write to the Department of Justice. We have on the Free Mark website, underneath where it says how you can help. Um, writing to the U.S. is very important. Uh, it's the end of the month, at the end of January, we will be making our submissions to the U.S. government, uh, through our lawyers, so we need people's letters to send to the U.S. Department of Justice on behalf of Mark. It only takes 20 minutes, it's very easy to do, um, I'll be putting out some more information, but we need people to do that first and foremost to get Mark home, so please do. And you can also send letters to Mark himself. Mark loves to hear from you guys. And there's a big banner at the top of Cannabis Culture. Click on that one and send Mark some letters. Tell him how things are going. So you can send him news, send him all kinds of stuff if you want to. It seems like this prison is a little bit easier on particulars about things you can send him. So there was at a time there was a bunch of really tight regulations, but we've been sending him news articles and stuff. Although you did get a few back. Uh, yeah, if you watch my latest show, which just got posted. Um, Make sure you subscribe. It's youtube.com slash pot TV network and youtube.com slash Jody Emery. That's where you'll be getting all the video updates from me. Jody's Once got new week. shows every week. Every week. And I just assigned Marijuana Man Greg Williams to one show a week as well. Nice. So that's going to be great because we need more content and Marijuana Man is awesome. So. I love his all his old shows. Yeah. One of the, some of the best shows on Pot TV. So encourage Very him. educational. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, so looks like we, we're doing good. We have 96 people online. Oh, nice. We love marijuana, man. So do we. Excellent. Yes. So, Jody, we were... Um, I was going to show them, actually. Here, this is the place that Mark is at right now. Now, this may cut the sound out for a sec, but look at the place Mark is in. That's D-Ray James Correctional Facility in Georgia. Yeah. And Jody took a picture when she was down there recently. I'll, here, I'll show you guys that one real quick. Has this sort of cold industrial look to it. It's really oh, sort yeah. of dusty it's around. It's definitely got way more barbed wire than it's supposed to as a low security. Uh, it used to be a violent medium security place for state prisoners and not, not well run then, just like it's not well, run yes. well now, but uh, for different reasons. So yeah, it's run like a, kind of like a medium high security, and it's very, well, prison-like. Right, and it's even worse than a regular U.S. prison. Mark is in, not in a regular Bureau of Prisons prison, a federal prison. He's in an INS type prison, an Immigration and Naturalization Services prison. And most of the people that he's in there with are immigrants from other places, from Mexico or South America. Uh, you know, there's very few people there that actually even speak English in the dorm that Mark's in. And in the entire prison, there's only just a few. 
So it's been really difficult for Mark because it's a totally different universe there, obviously. Yeah. And Mark's been paying a lot of attention to the way it works in a regular prison because he's been, you know, traveling through all these different prisons and he's seen how uh, things go and how things operate in those prisons. And now this other prison, which is supposed to be the same, they're supposed to be treating the prisoners there the same. But according to Mark, and in a chart actually that's published in Mark's latest blog, which is on the front page of Cannabis Culture, Mark lists off a bunch of different ways that it's actually different. Um, you know, and he's he's looked at all these different ways, and you it's know, like kind of big comparison charts. You know? It is. It's long. It's a couple pages. The one I have printed off. In fact, you can look at the. I've got a screenshot of it here. If you go to the show notes, you can find it there as well. And I'm just going to read off a couple of these ones here. Like Mark, when he was in the other prisons on his way down there and in Seattle, he was in a cell with one other person. So there's two man cells. Now where Mark is, he's one of 64 in a dorm. So it's just like this big, somebody said yesterday, it's like a homeless shelter. It's just this big room full of bunks and 64 in one dorm, it's pretty crazy. And they have no, in, in a regular prison, they have doors or curtains on showers and toilets. There's some level of privacy. You're in the, your own cell, you know, you have some time to yourself. But in this prison he's in now, there's no doors or curtains. Um, they have no privacy at any time. And there's a whole host of other differences. You know, they, as you, if you guys have been following this whole thing, and the reason, one of the things Mark's been asking is people to send stuff to the library because their library there is so bad, so bad. And, you know, most of the people there, probably over 600 of them speak Spanish, and they have very few Spanish publications in the library, almost no Spanish books. And so Mark's been asking for a lot of different... Uh, uh, books and magazines in Spanish as well so that the people there actually have something they can read because very few speak English um, and other things you know when it comes to your health I'd be concerned as a prisoner and Mark is a vegetarian and he doesn't eat meat um, but of course now he's been forced to eat meat because there's really nothing else they don't provide any vegetarian options and you wither up and die pretty much if you tried to eat just vegetarian stuff because he gets only one scrawny orange every two days that's all for, for, for the fruit and vegetables they get, or for fruits at least. And other places where Mark's been before, the other prisons, the BOP prisons, they usually receive fresh fruit with breakfast and lunch. Uh, you know, you want to, as a human being in prison, you want to stay healthy. And so, you know, it's, it's bizarre. A lot, I read a lot of comments of like, oh, well, you know, he's just whining, or they're just, you know, he's in prison, he should know it's supposed to be bad. And, but pe people that are in prison are human beings as well. And so we don't want to torture these people to death. And it seems to me that a lot of those people, when people say that stuff, they're advocating these horrific, torturous type of policies and saying, oh, just shut up and take it. But no, you know, they're, they're not dogs. They're humans as well. Prisoners have rights. But obviously in an immigration prison like the one Marks in, they don't really have rights because they're not American citizens. They're foreign nationals. So um, what are some of the other ones here? Yeah, this is what Mark gets to eat every day in jail at D. Ray James. He gets to eat uh, virtually the same every single day. Ground chicken that looks like ground beef, shredded lettuce, rice, beans, and tortilla. Every single day, that's all he gets. No, almost no other variables. And uh, on Christmas, Mark's Christmas dinner was a bologna sandwich. Two bologna sandwiches, actually. Well, you know, that's, that's just brutal, man. And it's just because, I guess, it's a private prison and they don't really want to pay a lot of cash for the prisoners. They're trying to s squeeze out every penny. And so they cut all these corners. It's a pretty brutal system in the States. It's totally different than in Canada. Um, but they have privatized prisons and they're actually squeezing profits out of these places. But to me, it kind of seems like another form of slavery when you throw a bunch of poor people in jail for these petty crimes and then extract dollars out of their asses. That's pretty harsh. That's like plantation mentality. They're, they got, And Mark's working for the massive sum of 12 cents an hour. That's how much he's making in his job, 12 cents an hour. So I guess you can't say they're not paying him. We've got to compete with China somehow, I guess. I guess that's how the U.S. is looking at it. Uh, yeah, exactly. Private prisons get all their money from drug arrests. They throw a bunch of guys in jail for nonviolent crimes and then have them work like slaves, basically, and make money. Well, and in Canada here, our government is uh, increasing our drug laws because they want to set up a similar system to that. They want to 
throws many Canadians in jail for small non-violent crimes like smoking pot and then they'll have this you know it's it's basically like a damn forced labor system it's just crazy it's nuts and I, I don't know it's one of the many crazy things that seem to be happening these days right in front of everybody's faces that just shock me on a constant level that everybody's just sleeping anyways um, so yeah the uh, the way you can help Mark is writing uh, to the government itself and if you go to freemark.ca there's a whole bunch of stuff there that will show you exactly what to do to help Mark so and please send him letters as well there's a banner up at the top of CC again that says send mail to Mark so please send Mark a letter he tries to get back to everybody who sends him a letter um, he's been busy now because of his job and hopefully he'll be stay busy with his job at the library um, but yeah there's lots of ways to help him and if you go there and if you go to actually I want to give whyprohibition.ca a plug um, there's lots of other ways you can help Mark and you can help in all general drug war activism and drug war uh, reform activism, policy reform. I'm mumbling away now. Anyways, what's next on the list? I'm looking at my list. Okay, so, oh man, crazy stuff going on this week. Other things. Um, Montel Williams. I don't know how many got people out there remember Montel. Montel had his talk show. And he has been a longtime advocate of medical marijuana, and he's a longtime medical marijuana user for his multiple sclerosis. And Montel this week was traveling in Milwaukee, in the Milwaukee County Sheriff's Office, busted him at the General Mitchell International Airport, and he had a little empty wooden pipe on him. And so they harassed him, shook him down and gave him a citation for that little pipe. Luckily it didn't have any really any of the resin left in it or whatever so they couldn't really bust him uh, in a harder way but they wrote him a citation for four hundred and eighty four dollars and they took his pipe and that's you know that's his method of delivery for his medicine that he is a legal medical marijuana user in the state. Obviously federal law in the US there is no such thing as legal any kind of marijuana including medical marijuana. So, uh, I really like Montel. I think he's an awesome advocate for our cause and for legalization of, uh, well, and he, he focuses more on medical marijuana, but I have a clip here uh, of Montel where he kind of breaks down the difference between hemp and cannabis and talks about, um, you know, why he thinks that cannabis is such an important plant. Now I'm going to play this for you and then I'm going to actually read Montel's statement about his latest $484 citation for his little pipe. So here's Montel. A, a, a marijuana plant, but the plant, the cannabis plant, hemp plant, this country was built on hemp. Hemp itself does not get you high. You can take hemp, it's, it's the extract that comes from the plant. It's a protein. The seed itself, hemp, there's two different conversations here. We'll have one first, then we'll have the other one second. The hemp product, America was built on hemp. All of the first, the forefathers grew hemp. Every sail, every rope, all the clothing that we wore in this country was, was grown on hemp, was made from hemp. Hemp itself is used all over the world. It's the highest or second highest protein content seed on the planet. Canada, all over the world, they eat hemp. Americans don't. And we just haven't done it because the government tricked us into believing that hemp was the same as marijuana. Now let's jump over here. That's a whole other issue. What causes the euphoria is, a, is not just hemp, that's when the plant's fully grown and now those seeds turn into cannabinoids and turn into a thing, a substance that makes you, gives you either euphoria or pain cessation. For 5,000 years, that plant was looked at as a medication all over the planet. It is now legal in 40 other countries around the planet. It has always been legal in other places on the planet. And then it knows that this plant is efficacy, so therefore it should be used for medicinal purposes. And I look at it this way. I have doctors who have put me on morphine. I have doctors who have put me on every opiate-based drug that there is. I can go out of here right now. I can pick up the phone right this second and have delivered here to this office to me any opium that I want, including pharmaceutical heroin, dimorphine. I can have it delivered right here. I can call a doctor and legally. Well, they won't deliver the dimorphine. I have to go sign for it. I can get it. 
If that doctor can put me on that, and the same doctor says, Montel, if your pain cessation is, is happening by eating or using marijuana, go right ahead and do so. Why should he not be able to recommend that to me? So that's why I am a supporter of, and I've supported it all of this country, and I won't, I won't stop until this president and this government recognizes the fact that it's just ignorance has been involved in this entire process, and so let's get smarter minds to prevail and do what's right. Okay. Hemp comes from the plant that's a, 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 a marijuana. So that was Montel. That was a cool little clip. I really like that one. Um, so, yeah, Montel, they shook him down at the airport, took his pipe, made him pay $484. Now, I'm sure Montel can afford that, but that's a lot of money for a citation over just a little pipe that he uses for a legal medical purpose in his state. So, um, I'm going to read Montel's statement after his uh, paraphernalia. It was for paraphernalia, the citation. So it was, you know, they cited him actually on this little obscure thing. Uh, hold on a sec here. So I'm just going to bring this up for you guys to see. I wish my sound wasn't cutting out as I placed it up, but that's okay. We'll fix that for next time. Here's the Facebook thing. You can find this on Montel's Facebook page, actually. I'll just put up for a sec. And I'm just going to read. Actually, I really liked what he had to say, so I wanted to read it to you guys. And it just sort of gives you a little insight into Montel himself. And it was just kind of a cool thing to say about this kind of thing. Um, so here's Montel. This is his statement about Milwaukee. Montel says, 11 years ago I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, and since that day I've been doing anything and everything I can to manage this disease, not only for myself, but for others affected as well. This week I was in Wisconsin for a follow-up appointment on a groundbreaking study that I've been involved in through the University of Wisconsin in Madison. The study could have tremendous impact on the lives of people with MS, as well as people with other neurological disorders such as traumatic brain injuries. After visiting with the scientists and researchers at the university, as you may have seen or heard, I was involved in an incident navigating through the security at Milwaukee's Mitchell Airport. I was stopped by TSA agents when a small wooden pipe was found in my carry-on bag during a secondary search. Unfortunately, this pipe, which I use to administer my medication, is deemed to be paraphernalia in Wisconsin. It's public knowledge that for the past 10 years I have been a leading proponent for the compassionate use of medical marijuana and access for patients through the United States. I've lobbied diligently to help the 15 states, including the District of Columbia, pass their current medical marijuana laws. After cooperating with the airport officials, and after the pipe I was carrying tested negatively for any residue, I paid a summons, boarded my flight, and headed home. Let me say clearly, I respect the TSA and the job they do. It's unfortunate that an incident like this, a minor infraction, distracted airport security to the extent that it did, wasting valuable time that could have been directed towards airline security. But I also have been extremely heartened and would like to say thank you to all those who have sent comments or emails today expressing their support. I only hope that the news of my experience encourages people to continue to push for legalization or legislation, sorry, that will allow Americans who need to have this have the safe access they deserve to medication without criminalization. So that was a cool thing by Montel. He's great. There's a ton of videos on YouTube of Montel talking about medical marijuana, why he uses it, talking about hemp, as you saw in that one. And uh, check that out. If you just go to YouTube and type in Montel Williams, you'll find a whole bunch of stuff. So, what else we got here on the list? Oh, man, so there's a bit of bad news. Um, this one is pretty harsh. Already, in 2011, there's been a drug war killing. The first one was in Massachusetts, at least the first recorded one. And there's an article about it in the show notes that you can find. I have it here. It's from the Drug War Chronicle from Phil Smith, who is fantastic. And if you guys haven't been to StopTheDrugWar.org, please go there. It's fantastic. And this article, Massachusetts Sees First U.S. Drug War Killing of 2011. And this is a pretty harsh one. A 68-year-old Framingham, Massachusetts man has become the first person killed by police enforcing the drug laws in enforcing drug laws in the U.S. And his name is Yuri Stamps, Sr. And he was fatally shot by a police SWAT team um, shortly after midnight Wednesday as police served a drug search on his house. And they haven't really released a lot of details, but his family and friends and neighbors have been talking to the press. Now I have a video here to play you guys of his son and other people 
um, talking about what happened there, and it's it's pretty bad. Um, I just wanted to say, read a part of this first. This is uh, Phil Smith's article. The, his friend um, described him as a very good man, the type of man who you'd give you'd give him the shirt off his back. This shouldn't have happened. And they say that he are investigating if the guy was armed, but a family friend told the Metro West newspaper that authorities said this shooting was accidental. So here's the video. He's made a mistake that cost his father his life. I'm Lisa Hughes. I'm Jack Williams. A 68-year-old retired MBTA worker was shot and killed by the SWAT team last night. WBZ's Paul Burton is live in Framingham tonight. Paul, we know you just spoke with the victim's son. He's saying that police did not need to shoot. Lisa, I tell you, there are a lot of questions that need answering, and right now police or the DA's office are not saying much at this time. They did release a statement just a short time ago saying that a 68-year-old man, we know his name now, Yuri Stamps, was killed inside this home while police were conducting a search for drugs. The person that shot him was a member of the police SWAT team, but they're not saying what led up to the shooting or why police felt the need to fire, but the family wants answers. Peaceful man as he is, it didn't warrant something like that. Marlon Stamps is devastated and angry. His 68-year-old father, Yuri Stamps, was killed early this morning during a drug raid by the Framingham Police SWAT team. It was complete insanity. It was so scary. It literally sounded like a grenade went off in my house. All the fire alarms, the smoke detectors all went off, and I just heard lots of noise. I was, like, scared half to death. Police arrested 20-year-old Joseph Bushvan of Framingham just outside his 26 Fountain Street home. Bushvan is the stepson of Yuri Stamps. Uh, police uh, seized from his uh, pocket uh, some what appeared to be crack cocaine. Police continued their sweep of that location. Uh, at some point during that sweep, um, a firearm was discharged at that point, and an individual who was uh, inside that residence uh, was hit by the firearm. Police began giving aid at that time. Also arrested was 20-year-old Devin Talbot of Boston. Right now, it's still unclear what happened inside the home during the raid. Family and witnesses say Yuri Stamps was a retired MBTA worker with a heart of gold, and they want answers as to why he was shot. They came here to, to serve a warrant. Problem is, they made a mistake. They made a very costly mistake. You know what I mean? It cost the life of my father. Now, police did remove cocaine from this home. Joseph Bushfan has, is being held. Okay. So, that's pretty bad. Um, the clip cuts off like that. But, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty brutal. And there's a bunch of this, I mean, this happens all the time. It's really horrible because this is happening constantly and it's bad. It's already the first week of the year, basically, and we have a another unit of police shooting somebody by accident because of the damn drug war. It's just really ridiculous. Uh, now, this article, at the top of it, and this is in the show notes, there's an editor's note from Phil at the Drug War Chronicle, and they're going to try and track every death directly attributable to drug law enforcement. And they, they uh, want anybody to send in any stories they find if they come across news of kind of a killing related to drug war enforcement. Please send them an email at psmith, P-S-M-I-T-H, at D-R-C-N-E-T, D-R-C-N-E-T.org. So check that out, and if you do come across anything, please send it to those guys. And go to stopthedrugwar.org, because it's a great website. I'm just smoking a joint here. So... <laughs> Ooh, good stuff, and I've turned on the vaporizer again, I'm going to go for another bag. Now I wanted to, it's just about been an hour here, but I wanted to end on kind of something funnier. Oh, and damn, you know, earlier today, I was going through my spice cupboard, and I came across a big bag of nutmeg, and I was going to bring it in with me. Now, I forgot to actually bring the bag, I was going to show you guys the awesome bag of nutmeg, because uh, I've, lately I've been suffering from nutmeg madness, and I think maybe I'm ruining my life, my life on nutmeg. It's this horrible new found high for teenagers, and I'm just joking, but kind of. If you go to cannabisculture.com right now on the front page, there's a story, a blog post that I wrote about. I called it nutmeg madness, and uh, there's this global news video 
that is so funny, it's just hilarious, about Nutmeg. And people have been, now, for most people probably don't know about Nutmeg and what it's been used for over the years, but Nutmeg has been used for thousands of years by cultures all over the place for a host of different uses, including medical uses, and indeed to get high on. Um, it does cause hallucinations if taken in larger amounts. Now, in my blog post, I have a list of the different dosages it would take to actually get high on nutmeg, and there's more information about the history of nutmeg, and there's really interesting, strange facts about nutmeg, like the Dutch actually traded Manhattan for an island that was a nutmeg producer, specifically because they wanted more nutmeg, so Manhattan was traded for nutmeg. And I, I guess, it, you know, in this, I'm going to show you guys this global news video just because it's so funny, and uh, we'll come back and talk about it for just a couple seconds and uh, puff out of the, the vaporizer. So here is the global news segment. They're snorting it, smoking it, and swallowing it. I'm already half, halfway high. Teens desperate to get high are turning to the internet and learning that nutmeg, yes, that common household spice, can take them there. Kind of gave me like a woozy feeling. This college student says she and four of her friends smoked the spice to catch a buzz. She was 15 and is now too embarrassed to show her face, but wants to warn parents about this newfound high kids are getting from a very old spice. We went on Google and we looked up things to, to smoke that you can use like from your house. So the nutmeg came up and my friend was like, oh, I have nutmeg. Teens report hallucinations for 24 hours or more. I slept basically for three days straight. And that the high is somewhat comparable to marijuana, except for the brutal side effects, which can include nausea, vomiting, abdominal pains, convulsions, seizures, and heart palpitations, followed by an extremely noxious hangover. I just felt like the blood was rushing in my head and I really was scared that I was going to die. Don't worry about the occasional sprinkle in your eggnog or pinch in the apple pie. Experts say you have to consume a lot of it, at least several tablespoons, to experience any hallucinations or negative side effects. Malcolm X wrote about how he was introduced to it by prison inmates. And for legendary jazz musician Charlie Parker, his abuse of nutmeg reportedly led to heroin addiction. Still, counselors warn locking up the spice rack isn't the answer. We want to know the whys, the underlying issues. People use substances or behaviors for reasons to cope. She says parents should look out for signs of kids withdrawing from the family, and if they discover abuse of nutmeg, they should take it seriously. The girl that I did it with, whose house it was at, actually, she just ended up trying more and more and more, and her life is a mess now. And large amounts of nutmeg are especially dangerous for pregnant women. According to the Poison Control Center of Utah, it can even cause miscarriage. It's really that strong. So how dangerous is it? Is it lethal, possibly? It totally is. Uh, experts say if mixed with certain types of medications, it can cause coma or death. Wow. Um, but I, I should note here that most teens, after their first trip, they avoid it like the plague because the side effects are really that bad. And, of course, the message we want to get here is never try it at all. Yeah. The hangover as you were saying, is, is so not noxious. Okay. This is just not somewhere yes. kids should ever go. Absolutely. All right, Mina, thank you so much. Yeah. Ah! Killing that Meg! It's coming after your teenagers. Lethal. Crazy stuff. So, it's, you know, that is, of course, bullshit. Really, I mean, there, there are supposedly a couple reported deaths now, if there's two in the entire, you know, thousands and thousands of year history of this, and I guess the recorded history isn't that long, but there's two that are sort of attributable, kind of, to nutmeg, they think. Uh, one is an eight-year-old kid, and the other is someone who mixed it with some other drug or something. And so there's two in the entire history. Compare that to alcohol, and that's, that's if those are true, that somebody has actually died from nutmeg. But most people don't. They experience, you know, mild, you know, feelings. If you take a lot of it, though, um, there can be some hallucinations and uh, the, the effects, they might make you feel like you're in a dream or something like that. You can go and check it out on my blog. There's actually a link in my blog to a really exhaustive article about the entire history of nutmeg use, uh, what it's used for, and you know, I actually like to put it on my eggnog at Christmas time, and so maybe I'll be dumping a little extra on there next Christmas. <laughs> but so yeah man, all you guys out there, 
love that you guys tune in. We had like 98 viewers rolling through right now, and it was up and down around 100 the whole time today. Excellent to see all you guys here. I love doing the show. There's going to be lots more. And I think that was pretty much it for today. So tune in next week. Um, we may have Ted Smith on the show, uh, activist from Vancouver Island, cannabis activist who's putting on a big uh, conference there. We'll be talking to him. And uh, yeah. Oh, the vaporizer. I guess I should load up one more vaporize. Vaporization hoot balloon here. Let's get this thing going. And so I've kind of, you can jack it up as you go. This one's already been hit that one time, or maybe we did two bags. So a third bag, usually after three bags, that's pretty much it for the vapor, for the weed. And then you take that brown stuff out of there. But we'll try and get another bag here. Alright. And we'll go out with a big bag. Big vapor hoot. And so, yeah, as I, I heard Jairus Mark Emery's son. <laughs> No, that's not true. Although Mark does have an adopted son named Jeremy, though. But he's not me. No. No, I'm uh, a friend. I, I met Mark just a few years ago, and it was really hilarious when I first met Mark. I came in, I actually found the uh, listing for this job on Craigslist. We were at the time producing the print magazine of Cannabis Culture, and they needed somebody to come and help do editing. And I came down and talked to Mark, saw the ad, and he brought me in and he was talking to Jody on the phone and the only thing she wanted to know was, is he a chronic? And of course I smoke pot every day and have for a long time. And uh, so they hired me on that basis, I guess. And it seemed to uh, turn out all right. I love Mark to death. I love Mark like a father, actually. Mark is, you know, very father-like to all the people here. And people look to Mark uh, like kind of like a dad and look to him for all kinds of stuff because Mark is such a damn bright guy and I correspond, I send letters to Mark all the time and you guys can too if you go to CannabisCulture.com and click on that link at the top. Mark really appreciates hearing from everybody because it's Mark is from this universe where he's in constant touch with everybody and seeing, reacting with people and always you know, doing that kind of stuff, constant communication and now he has none of that so it's very difficult and we're trying to get him uh, as much of that as possible. So here's a big bag, going out with a bag. Vaporizing, if you guys like vaporizing, check that article out. It's a cool uh, little bit, tidbits of information if you're wondering how to do it right. And there's a lot more at CanvasCulture.com, as always. Check that out. And thanks for being here, guys. One more bag rep. And we'll see you guys next week. Peace and pop, baby.